Father, this morning we thank you that we are redeemed, that you have loved us and pursued us from heaven, that in Jesus Christ you have forgiven all of our sins, you have rescued us from hell, and you have made us your own. And we are not who we used to be. Thank you. But according to your word, we are not yet who we're going to be. And for that, we thank you. And today, we simply ask that you would meet us in this place, that you would take your truth and apply it to our lives, that we can take one more step towards who we're going to be and leave who we used to be behind. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles uh, or your Bible apps on your device and turn to the book of Philippians. Chapter 4 is where we're going to be. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. There's some in the pews around you. They look a lot like this one. Grab one of those and turn to page 1,250 because Philippians is way towards the back. Uh, and by the way, if you need a Bible, feel free to take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, and allow it to speak into your life. Hey, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed or if you uh, read the paper today, but we were front page uh, about our groundbreaking and everything. That's kind of cool. Uh, and they got most of the stuff right, uh, so uh, that's, that's also a bonus. There's a couple of little corrections I thought I'd just go ahead and mention to you when you read the article or if you read the article and you were a little confused. Uh, first of all, they use the word members uh, where we use the word attenders uh, to talk about how many people actually show up because uh, a lot of churches have a lot more people on their rolls than they actually have in their seats. We're the other way around. <laughs> we have a lot more people actually show up than uh, are, are members of the church. Uh, and then uh, the other thing, and this was kind of a big one, we're actually building a 900-seat auditorium, not a 900-foot auditorium. <laughs> it's kind of a big difference right there. Just thought I'd mention that, because uh, this one's like 5,000 square feet, uh, and, uh, you know, 900 square feet would be about the stage. Uh, so we want something a little bigger than that, because uh, uh, we want you to have a place to sit, not just for you, but for your friends as well. So uh, anyway, it's still, uh, it's great publicity, and we, we appreciate the fact that they did an article on us uh, before we even broke ground, so that was kind of a surprise. Hey, we're continuing our study today on contentment out of Philippians chapter 4, and last week uh, we discussed that Paul had learned to be content in every circumstance that he was in. He had learned to be content whether he had abundance, lots of stuff, everything's good. He had learned to be content when he had nothing. Uh, when he was in prison, he was content. When he was free, he was content. When things were going well, he was content. When things were not going well, he was still content. And he said in verse 13, the reason he can do this is because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. And, and so he said, that's why I can be content. So we learned last week that we can be content. And so today we're kind of finishing this passage in Philippians 4, and it contains an amazing promise. We're going to pick up in verse 14, uh, Philippians 4, 14. The apostle writes, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The promise. The Philippian church uh, was very close to and very invested in the life of the Apostle Paul. And, and uh, the Philippian church was the first one that was established in what's now Europe. Uh, Paul had a vision. He went to Macedonia and he started the church in Philippi. And they uh, continued to support him in his missionary journeys and his time in prison. They never stopped. They developed this bond with him. They cared about him. Uh, when nobody else was taking care of him, they were still sending the love gifts, the care packages, uh, all those things that he is expressing appreciation for. 
And he said, look, I, I appreciate those deeply. Uh, I want you to know I got it, but here's the thing that I'm most excited about is that God blesses you because you're being faithful to him and you're being generous. And so I'm really excited about the fact that you get the, the fruit of that. And then he concludes with this promise, this incredible promise. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God's going to take care of your needs. So if we belong to Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we have made a commitment to follow Jesus with our lives, then we belong to Jesus. We belong as part of the family of God. Because Scripture says that uh, to as many as received him, even those who believed on the name of Jesus, have become children of God. Children of God. So we're in the family, and that, therefore we belong to Jesus, and God promises to meet our needs out of his never-ending supply of riches. Isn't that cool? It is awesome to be a child of God. And that is such an incredible and wonderful promise. So, of course, as the children of God, then we naturally live perfectly contented lives. No, we don't, but... But why not? I mean, because God's going to meet all of our needs out of his never-ending supply of riches. Why wouldn't we be content? Oh, yeah, the, the promise leads us to talk about the problem. And, and really, the problem is kind of obvious uh, if we're paying attention. Uh, and, and the problem, as I see it, is this, that God supplies our needs, not our wants. God supplies our needs, not our wants. Uh, my youngest daughter, Alyssa, was about uh, six or seven years old when, uh, about this time of year, the, she got a hold of the Christmas catalog when it came in the mail before we did. And she went through that catalog, and every page that had any item that pertained to little girls, she identified the things that she wanted us to get her for Christmas. And so there were, uh, every, every page had stuff circled on it. A lot of pages had everything circled on them. And she was so excited, and she, she brought that to us and said, Here, I, here's what I want for Christmas. I made this easy for you. And, uh, and her, her tender, selfish heart was crushed when we explained to her that she had to go back through the catalog and only circle a few things that she really, really wanted and not everything that she wanted. And, and she grieved the fact that we limited what she could ask for. Uh, and, and uh, of course, we laughed. It was cute. It was funny. It was childish. Uh, and, uh, but the truth is, even if we had the money, we wouldn't have given her everything that she wanted. We would not. And, and it's not healthy to do that. And everyone who's a parent uh, or has been a parent knows that you can't give every, your child everything they want. We all draw boundaries with our, our kids. We don't give them what they want all the time. We, we know that we can't do that because if we did, it wouldn't be healthy for them, right? Because if you say, you know, hey, what do you want to eat? They're, they're you know, they want candy and ice cream at every meal, right? And we have to say, no, you can't have all the candy. Eat something healthy like Frosted Flakes. <laughs> they don't laugh. That's my cereal, all right? They're great. And... Uh, and so we know the kids are not going to choose the best when it comes to the food that they eat. And so we try to, you know, set some boundaries and help them that way. And we know that our children don't always want to bathe. And they need to bathe, right? I mean, it's like something happens where they don't really develop their sense of smell until they hit about 11 or 12. And suddenly they're aware that they stink and then they start drowning themselves in acts and other things that you wish they wouldn't. You know, or we don't give our children the option because sometimes they don't want to brush their teeth, right? And yet we'd like them to have teeth, so we make them go in there and you will brush them. And sometimes our kids, they don't want to go to school, do they? Oh, I have to go to school today. Do I have to go to school today? I, I think about the kindergartner, the you know, first day of school, they went and, you know, they came back. And mom's like, how was it? Great. And the next morning she woke him up and he said, I did that yesterday. I don't want to go back. Yeah, well, you're going to go back today and every day for 12 years, you know. Get used to it because, you know, we're not giving you that choice. We're not giving you what you want. Because it's our job as parents to do what they need, 
not what they want. And, and so it's our job to meet their needs, but not their wants. And, and, and let's just go ahead and admit it. We love to bless our children. We love to bless our grandchildren. We, we, that's something that's just part of our lives, and we want to give them gifts. But even as imperfect people, we understand if we give them everything that they want, then it will ruin their lives. Now, think about this. We have a heavenly father who loves us and who loves to bless us. I mean, we know that God loves us because uh, he demonstrated that love in Jesus. Scripture says that for God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And and so we know that God loves us. We know that he has uh, saved us from our sins. He's adopted us into his family. He's made us children of God. and, and, And he loves to bless us. And he has promised to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And often as his children, (laughs) we want stuff. And we bring to him our catalog with everything circled. And we ask for it. And, and, And we are crushed when God says no. Even though it's for our benefit that God doesn't give us everything we think we want. And, and, and we, you know, we argue with God and, and, and we say things like, you know, God, but I, I'm, I'm mature. I, I can handle it. I, it's, I, I know what's best for me. You're so mean. Right? Because honestly, if we're, if we're truthful about it, don't we act just like our children when they're throwing the temper tantrum because they don't get what they want, when a lot of times we don't get what we want? You see, the truth is, selfishness is the source of our discontent. Selfishness is the source of our discontent. If you'll flip back uh, a few pages further, uh, about 40 pages or so, to uh, James chapter 4, <laughs> if you have a Bible like mine, it's 40 pages, uh, James chapter 4, James is written by the brother of Jesus, uh, is the brother of Jesus, and he wrote this book, and it's very straightforward, very direct, and this is a passage that really talks about our selfishness being the source of our discontent. So I want you to hear this in James' own words. Beginning in verse 1, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? That's a good question, isn't it? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Why do we fight? Why can't we get along? Why are we living in this discontented state of conflict? Because our passions, our desires, our coveting, all of them are some form of wanting. Our wants are driving us into this place of discontent. I want for my pleasure, I want for myself, I want what you have. Why should you have it and not me? I want it. And and you don't have because you don't ask God. And sometimes we don't ask God because we already know what the answer is, right? Come on, honestly, think back to when you were kids. There were some things you didn't ask your parents for, you just went and did anyway. Right? And got in trouble for it later because you knew what they were going to say before you ever asked them. So you just avoided the question. And aren't we that way with God? Sometimes we want something and we know it's wrong and we know it's not good for us. And so we don't even ask God. We just go and, and invite the pain into our life anyway. Knowing ahead of time God's not going to give us that. And then when we do ask God, when we do come to God and say, God, can we have this please? He, he says no because we want it for the wrong reason. We want it selfishly. We want to spend it on us. See, when we focus on our wants, our selfish desires, we end up miserable because we're angry at God for saying no and we're fighting with everyone else. I want it. What are you willing to do to get it? Break relationships? Offend those around you? Hurt the people you love? I want it. So we have this awesome promise from God. My God will supply all of your needs according to his 
riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That is so cool. And we have a very real problem of deep-rooted selfishness. Every one of us, because of the sin nature in us, we want for our stuff. Our passions are waging war within us. Our desires are fighting against the, you know, the good desires of God and the evil desires. We're, we're a mess. So how do we live a contented life? We can do it because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. How do we do it? How do we get there? Well, I think we need a new perspective. A new perspective. Um, God gave us this book so that we could see ourselves in its pages and learn how God sees life and start living it from God's point of view. Okay, that's, that's why we study the Bible. That's why we want you to read the Bible. That's why if you don't have a Bible, take one. Because when we read this, it tells us how God thinks and how God sees this world and this life. And if we will apply how God sees it, he'll change our mind, he'll change our vision, he'll change our actions, and we'll find that place of contentment. So let's talk about this new perspective that, that allows us to uh, enjoy the promise. And, and it boils down to this. What do you, today at least, what do you need? If my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, then what do you really need? Honestly, truthfully, absolutely, what do you need? Not what do you want, not what are you hoping for, but what do you need? Um, let's boil it down. Because I identified three things I think all of us really need. Um, remember, this is God's perspective. First of all, we need food, shelter, and clothing. We need the basic necessities of life, right? You know, everybody knows this. Uh, and by the way, uh, we pretty much have it. Food, shelter, and clothing. In fact, we have more food than we need. Right? I mean, obesity is kind of identified as a major health problem in the United States of America. And, and, and even the poor people in this country have too much to eat. In fact, we're the first society in the history of the world that has the problem of having too much food for all of us. Right? Yeah, yeah you've studied history. I mean, there's still famines going on in this world. There's still people dying of starvation and starvation-related illnesses. In this world today, we're just not those people. We've got more than enough, and I'm living proof right here. Okay? We don't, we don't have any shortage of food. In fact, I mean, think about this. We pay people more money so that we can have less food. Right? It's called diet stuff. <laughs> that's, how, that's how obsessed we are because we can't exercise self-control and just eat less of it. We have to pay extra money so that somebody can ration out how many calories are in the Oreos in a little bag. Instead of just eating less Oreos out of the big bag. <laughs> because we got too much food. So God's taking care of that. He's met our need of food. What about shelter? Well, God's pretty much taking care of that too, hasn't he? Because most of us live in homes that in many countries, two to four families would live in instead of two to four people. That's reality. So he's got the food. He's got the shelter. Seriously, do we need to talk about clothing? <laughs> I mean, think about this. I'm not going to ask you to confess, but a number of you ladies stood in your closets this morning and, and looked at, at outfit after outfit after outfit and then declared, I've got nothing to wear. <laughs> right? And some, of the, and some of the guys at the last service said, hey, we did too. So, you know, I don't know what's up with that. I don't have that problem. I have a clothing fairy that lives with me. Clothes just lay or laid out, and I put them on. It's wonderful. But we don't have an issue with clothes. In fact, you think about this. You know, we've got closets that 50 years ago in houses would have been bedrooms. Right? I'm thinking, going, oh, I could advertise my house not as a three-bedroom, but as a five-bedroom house. You should have to go through a bedroom to get to a bedroom. So, uh... Uh, you know, we don't have an issue with clothing, and, and I'm pretty sure that if there was ever a shoe shortage, ladies, have we got it covered? Because a lot of you have been storing up lots of extra supplies. Uh, at least we have at my house. I don't know about yours. So our, our first need, food, shelter, and clothing, we've got that. God's already met those needs. Uh, we ought to be thankful for that. And um, we need meaningful relationships. We need meaningful relationships. We were created for loving, intimate relationships. Uh, in the beginning, we were created for relationship with God. 
Uh, every one of us was made to have an intimate love relationship with the creator of the universe. How do I know that? Because we were made in the image of God so that we could relate to him directly. And in the garden, before there was sin, God walked with Adam and Eve. He was there. It was a face-to-face relationship. Our rebellion messed that up, and then God didn't leave us in that place of rebellion. Instead, he sent Jesus into this world to rescue us so that we could have that relationship again. And when you confess Jesus as Lord, God puts his Holy Spirit in you so that you can have a direct conversation with him all the time. It's called prayer. And so God desires this relationship with you, and you were made for this relationship with God. And our discontent is oftentimes because we do not nurture or pursue that love relationship with the living God. And if you want to grow in contentment, then you need to focus some of your life on building a better relationship with Jesus. And, and, and I can't do that for you, and and that's why we talk about things like reading your Bible and praying and and getting involved in life groups and things like that because we want to encourage that relationship with the living God, but this is something you have to pursue because Jesus said, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me, you'll find me, And, and God is waiting to reveal himself to you and open up your eyes to see new things about yourself and about the world, but you've got to seek him, actively seek him. Uh, Another really cool promise that God makes uh, is through the psalmist, David, in Psalm 37, 4. He he says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, some people have, and I've actually heard people say, well, you know, in essence, you can manipulate God, because if you delight yourself in God, you get everything you want. And and it does say, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. But what it doesn't tell you is as you get closer to God, he changes your desires. And you stop wanting the trivial, selfish stuff, and you start wanting the things of God. But you grow in contentment as you do that. And as you get closer to God, then, then the stuff that plagues our life now loses its significance. And we grow in our contentment. So, we were created for relationship with God. We were also created for relationships with family. Go back to the garden. Before there was sin in the world, before it was messed up, God said to Adam, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so he created a woman and put them together and so they could be partners in this life and they could share life together and the joys and the difficulties and, and the celebrations and they could love each other. And, and, and we were made for relationship. And so contentment is wrapped up in intimate love relationships, husband and wife, parents and children, family of God, friends that you share life with. This is where where contentment is found because those are meaningful relationships. And that is a, a statement that is biblical, and yet selfishness shreds those relationships. Every time we step into those intimate love relationships and we bring our selfishness into that and let that dominate us, then we are destroying our relationships. Think about this. Think about the, and I'm sorry, I'm a guy, so I'm just gonna speak as the husband. If I look at my wife and I go, I want my wife, I want my wife to make me happy. (laughs) There's an amen back there. (laughs) As opposed to the people who are going, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, (laughs) And yet we actually selfishly place these unreal expectations on one another. I want my wife to make me happy is never going to happen because God did not create her to make me happy. So that's just reality. He didn't create any person in this world to make you happy either. And and what happens because of our selfishness is, is that we look at our spouses sometimes, usually when there's legal papers involved, and go, you don't make me happy anymore. And so I'm going to, you know, follow the lie of Hollywood and I'm going to go find my soulmate because you obviously weren't it because you don't make me happy. And I'm going to troll Facebook and find some old girlfriend or something and I'm going to put all that burden of my happiness on them and, and, and they'll be able to withstand that pressure for a little while but eventually that will crumble under the, the pressure too and they won't make me happy anymore either. It is no one's responsibility to make you happy. You're only going to find that joy, that contentment, if you put that burden on Jesus. And you love Jesus. And then he's going to bring contentment into your life. But you crush your family when you say, 
I want my wife to make me happy. I want my spouse to look a certain way. Uh, I want my spouse to meet my needs. And then we carry that over and we put it on our children. And we say things to our kids like, hey, you got to make me look good. We don't actually say that, do you? We just want it. I want my kids to make me look good. It comes out in things like this. Don't you embarrass me in public. I know that none of you ever had your parents tell you that, or you never said that to your kids. Um, my parents used to, you know, pretty much state the impossible to me. Don't say anything that's going to embarrass us. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and confess now. Go ahead and spank me now, because it's, it's just going to end badly. Because <laughs> I have a lot more control now than I did as a child. So, uh, although fear was a great motivator, right? Uh, so... You know, we, we put these burdens on our kids, and don't you embarrass me. You know, I want you to get good grades. I want you to perform athletically, exceptionally. I want you to stay out of trouble. Why? So that I can look like a great parent. I want. And we destroy our children. Actually, we push them into doing the things we don't want them to do. Because if we're modeling what selfishness is, they're going to live it out too. And our selfishness destroys our families, I want, will always end in discontent. Contentment results from I will. I will. I will love and serve my wife. I will encourage and bless my children. I will help my family to be the people that God made them to be. I will forgive people because I've been forgiven. I will put others' needs ahead of my wants. Are you an I want or an I will kind of person? Is your life consumed by I want or is it guided by I will? That's a conversation I hope you and God will have this week because that's the source of your contentment or discontentment based on which way you're leaning. I want or I will. See, we need meaningful relationships with God and with others. And finally, we all need a purpose. Purpose in life. You see, God created us for relationships and for a reason. And, and I believe that uh, our purpose is to participate in the family business. See, if you're in the family of God because you believe in Jesus, you follow Jesus, then understand that you're already part of a, an, a ministry, an organization, a family that is uh, committed to a mission. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And he has given to us the ministry and the message of reconciliation. What does that mean? That means that the family business is to bring people to a place where they can join with us in saying, I am redeemed. I am not who I used to be. That I've experienced this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the family business is. That's what you and I are called to, entrusted to by the living God. So what are you doing to participate in God's mission of life change? Now, as a church, we offer you all kinds of ways to serve, from, from the helping ministries that are all around that you see on the weekends to events in the community and activities. And, and you can go to the ends of the earth and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can love people all over the place. But let me just tell you something. The most important ministry that every single one of you has is to walk out of these doors and to go into this community living as the representatives of Jesus Christ, people of character, people of kindness, people of integrity, people who love. Sharing the fact that God has changed your life with your friends, with your neighbors, with your coworkers, and inviting them to step into that same place of faith. And if you can't share that, then just invite them to come to church with you so that we can share that for you. You see, that's your first and priority ministry out into the world to make a difference, to have a purpose. And, and, and you don't have to come up here on stage and preach or sing or testify. You just simply have to go be the people of God in this community. And let God change lives through you, one person at a time. That's how we're going to lead this community to Jesus Christ. 
You see, at Calvary, we exist to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. The more you participate in God's purpose, the more your contentment's gonna grow in life. But if you focus on your purpose, it doesn't matter if that's a good purpose or not, work, success, possessions, pleasure, whatever, your dissatisfaction is going to grow. You see, selfishness always leads to discontent. Serving leads to satisfaction. Selfishness always going to take you to discontent. Serving is going to lead you to satisfaction. So what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? Are you going to live a an I want kind of life or an I will kind of life? Are you going to get wrapped up in selfishness or are you going to serve the living God? Choose well because your contentment is on the line. Will you pray with me? Father, your grace is amazing. Your truth is incredible as it applies to our lives. And we confess that so often we are consumed by our own selfishness. Our desires, our passions that wage war within us. And Lord, we're tired of losing that war. We want you to teach us how to win it. How to see this world from a different perspective. How to become people who serve. People that live in the I wills, not the I wants. So change our hearts. We give ourselves to you fully and completely in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.